there was a question which I didn't quite answer very clearly, and I realized there's so as you can imagine, these proofs are longer, and I cut because I need to make it palatable for the classroom. Um, and I think I missed a line which which I was telling them, and, and, and now I realized which one. And, and sometimes I assume something, and I don't write it. So the question that everyone had was, why is it that the norm of, why does this claim hold? Because this is not obvious. So there's a line before that which I missed, which I didn't. Let me just tell you what that was. So essentially what we have was x hat was equal to t of phi of x hat. OK? Now we know that phi is a mapping that goes from C to C, which implies that phi of x hat lies in the ball, which means that the norm of phi of x hat is less than 1, which means that t is equal, which is equal, look at t, t is equal to, if I take norms on both sides, I get x hat is equal to t times norm of phi of x hat, which implies that t is equal to uh, norm of x hat divided by norm of phi of x hat. But we know this is less than equal to 1, which means this is greater than x hat. But we know this is equal to 1, which means t is greater than 1, sorry, t hat. But we know that t hat lies in 0, 1, implying t hat is less than 1. These together mean t hat is equal to 1, which then mean that phi of x hat is equal to x hat. So, so I had this long line of thing, and I think I somehow killed it. And you can see why. So it's kind of, but that's how you get this equal to 1. Arno, is this clarify your concern? So thanks for raising it. So, um, so once you have that, this, this line, I need to put that back here. Okay, so um, the slides have some discussion on set valued maps and the ability to discuss, uh, ability to formulate problems which are, which are merely continuous, not just continuously differentiable. But I don't want to do that now because what I'd rather do is, so this is Kakutani's fixed point theorem, allows you to deal with that problem. Um, so just so that you know why this is relevant, it's relevant if I gave you a, a payoff function which was just continuous and convex, then if you wrote out the variational problem, the mapping is no longer single valued, it's set valued. If it's set valued, then you need to use a different fixed point here. The one that you need to use is Kakutani. Okay? Okay. So, um, so I don't want to do this fixed point theorem, I mean the, the contraction part. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start getting down to the nuts and bolts of applying fixed point theory to getting solutions of the variational inequality or getting existence statements of the variational inequality problem. So the first statement, so remember we had one statement already. You directly apply Brouwer, right, on the, uh, so the first statement we had, and let's keep writing those out. The first statement we had was f is continuous and k is non empty closed and convex if you look at this this emerges whenever you have games with convex payoff functions or sorry convex cost functions or convex and uh, differentiable cost functions, and con compact, convex, non-empty strategy sets. Okay, so this is a broad class of games. Okay, and how do we do it? The idea was x is equal to. So we use the idea of the natural map, and this was the gx, and we just used Brouwer's fixed point here. Okay. Now we're going to look at a, a situation where k is just non-empty and so this sorry also has to be 
So this is non-empty, uh, compact and convex, okay. And now we're just going to say closed and convex. Now you might say, why do I care? Well, whenever you are working with electricity markets where you have prices, right, or any kind of Lagrange multipliers, you can't put an ex ante bound on those. So you cannot use that first theorem unless you know that there's a price cap. So if you have no access to price caps or you don't want to put artificial bounds, you need to have a stronger statement with weaker assumptions. That's what the next one will do. Okay. Uh, so the next result is, so we're going to use an extension theorem. And this was the point I think that somebody raised, I think Fabio raised this, that the Brouwer's theorem essentially goes from C to C. Using this uh, extension theorem, you can, you, can you can construct a continuous map. Uh, so, so if you have a map that goes from C to Rm, then you can actually have a map that goes from Rn to Rn, and then you can actually get a result which is more general. Okay. So let's, let's go through this result. And now you can see, I'm going to give you conditions which you can actually evaluate. So this condition, you can actually go and analyze for your problem. It takes a little bit of analysis, but that's what it takes when you lose compactness. You need some, need to analyze a little more. Okay, so let's, let's think about these results. So the first thing is that there is a, a set, there's a vector x hat such that this set is bounded or empty. And if this holds, you can directly claim from here that the solution to the VI exists. So what do you need here? K is closed and convex, F is continuous. Okay. The only thing that you need to go and check is this. Okay. And uh, how do you check that? Well, the way to check that is just algebra. There's no other way. I mean, you really have to, and I'll show you some analysis for that. We'll talk about how to do that. In fact, I'll do that in the stochastic regime. I'll show you how to do that more generally. Um, and if this holds, then you can, you can not only say, you can not only say that a solution exists, but you can say that the solution set is compact. So the set of equilibria lies in a compact set. So this was a question I think Jalal has asked me and others have asked me. Uh, can you get uniqueness? And I'll show you uniqueness statements. But maybe one step away from uniqueness is to show compactness of the set of equilibria. The equilibria do not, you don't have rays of equilibria that can go unbounded. Okay, so if somebody tells you I found an equilibrium where the price is massive, then you have to start wondering if this condition holds whether that's true, right? Or something. There's some aspect of the equilibrium that is unbounded, or, or is becoming arbitrarily large. Okay, so let's start by by proving this result. So what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to show this. You know, first A implies B. Right. So let the condition A hold, then there exists an open bounded set containing, so what is this? Remember what this condition is? We are trying to show L hat is bounded, and if I show L hat is bounded, then I have to show that this condition holds. And if I show this holds, then I can show this holds. Okay. So it's going to be A implies B implies C. So the first thing is that L hat of X, L, uh, sorry, uh, L less than of X uh, hat is a bounded set. Look this set is bounded. So if it's bounded, it's intersection. So what we have is there exists an open bounded set containing this and the vector x hat. Why? If I tell you, if I tell you that I've got a set that is bounded and I've got another vector, I can always enlarge that set so that it contains this set and that vector, right? So if I have, there exists an open bounded set such that contains L hat, oh, sorry, L less than and X hat, where X hat is an omega and L less than intersection boundary of omega is the, is the empty set. Let me give you a picture to, to grasp that. So let me write down the conditions so that you, you understand the conditions. So the condition A is, 
there exists an x hat in K such that L less than or x hat which is given by the set of x such that x minus yeah, x hat transpose f of x is less than 0 uh, is bounded. Okay. B f of x transpose x minus x hat for all x and k intersection boundary right so here there exists a bounded set omega k intersection omega okay and the c is v i k f has a solution Okay, so I'm going to show A implies B implies C. Okay, so if you look at this, right? So now, so I've got, I've got some omega. I've got some set, and if you look at this, we have that x hat lies in k intersection omega. This is x hat. Um, and uh, sorry, this is this has to be um, yeah, and L hat has to be such that it lies inside this boundary. Okay, or oh, L less than. Okay. Okay. So let's. So A implies B is. Let's let's go ahead and do that. So, so let A hold. This implies there exists uh, an L less than of x hat, which is bounded. Okay. Now, since this is bounded, you can construct an open bounded set. Construct an omega bounded open such that x hat lies in omega and intersection bounded. Now you might say, oh. Suppose this does intersect, if it intersects, just make it larger. Now the question is, why sh can you always make something larger? Well, you can because omega is in your hand and L less than is actually a bounded set. So if it's a bounded set, I can just introduce a larger set. Okay, that's not difficult. Now, so if that holds, if that holds, why is it that B follows? Let's look at B. Okay. So what we are saying is x hat lies in k intersection omega such that f of x transpose x minus x hat is greater than or equal to 0. So look, if you look at this x hat, for what values of x does this not hold? So what happens when, what happens when you have x outside x and less than x hat? How do you define an element of L less than x hat. Look, L less than x hat contains those x for which this product is less than 0. So when x does not lie in L less than x hat, what you have is x minus x hat transpose f of x is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. 
So now what I've done is I've created a bounded set that contains this, that contains this and a vector x hat such that, such that, now remember this doesn't intersect the boundary of omega, right? So the, if it doesn't intersect the boundary of omega, it doesn't intersect k intersection of the boundary of omega. If it doesn't intersect the k intersection of the boundary of omega, it means for those x, this has to hold. Okay, why is that? I just want to make sure. You have L less than. I've put a set and it doesn't intersect the boundary of, uh, so I've put a big set around it. This doesn't intersect the boundary of omega. And so now we know that stuff outside, I'm only interested, in, what am I interested in? I'm interested in where this boundary intersects, you know, whatever the original set that you have, K or whatever. Okay. So, so just to make sure everybody grasps this, I mean, the, my drawing it doesn't really capture it because it's a, it's like an intersection of several sets. It's K, L less than, uh, and omega. What you want to remember is that this set is bounded, so I've encircled it with something. If I'm outside this set, then we have that this inner product is greater than or equal to zero. Now, remember that this set is, since it's bounded, the set I've put around it, the set I've put around it, essentially, it, we're only worried about those x that lie in k and intersect boundary of omega. But this set encircles it. So its boundary never comes in contact with this. Okay? So as a consequence, you can claim this. The harder question, the harder question, you see, look, this intersection is the empty set. Now, the harder question is claiming existence from B. How do you claim that this implies this? Okay. So the first thing you want to do is you want to now start analyzing that problem. Right? So if you look at F, F goes from K to Rn. But we, we don't know what values F takes outside K. Right? So then we use something called the, the extension of f from k to rn. So what that means is, if I have a mapping which is not defined outside the set, I can just approximate it outside the set using some continuous function. Okay, Some continuous function. And all that we need is this f hat and f have to be identical on k. Outside that, it's some continuous mapping. Doesn't matter. Okay, So now, I had f transpose x minus x hat greater than or equal to 0. That was b, remember? But this is for all x and k intersection boundary of omega. But we know f and f hat agree on k. So I can replace fx with f bar x. Okay, so now I can also define the natural map on the set uh, k. Remember the natural map? The natural map is x minus the projection times x minus f bar of, uh, so normally it should be f of x, I'm defining the natural map for f bar. Why has, why has the natural map suddenly made an entrance? It's made an entrance because if I can get a zero of the natural map, I can show that the, the vi has a solution. Okay, so you can see where this is heading. This is basically heading towards trying to show existence of a solution to this nonlinear equation. Okay, so consider two cases. The first case, Suppose f nat of x star is 0 for some x star on the boundary of omega. Okay. If this is the case, then x star is a solution to vi of k of f bar, because I use a natural map with k bar, with f bar. But since f bar and f coincide on k, it follows that x star is a solution to the original problem. Okay. So we are done if, if f bar of, f bar of uh, k of... Uh, x is equal to 0 at some point in the boundary. Now, of course, you'd be extremely fortunate for that to happen. And the more likely possibility is that that doesn't happen. Right? So let's look at case 2. Now, suppose now that f bar nat of x is not 0 for any x in boundary omega. Okay? And the reason why this is useful is this is going to be our starting point for just using a degree theoretic argument. Okay, so we're going to consider the bounded open set omega that we had, and I'm going to construct a homotopy. 
Now look, this homotopy is slightly different. I think somebody else had this question about using different homotopies. But here's a, a somewhat different homotopy that we used. So instead of using pi minus, you know, remember last time we had t times phi. Now what we have is instead of using pi minus just the standard projection of x minus f of x, I'm going to say t times x minus f of x plus 1 minus t times x hat. So it's a somewhat more involved homotopy. And you'll see that there's a lot of skill in, required in coming up with the right homotopy. That you have to guess almost. So let's make sure everybody understands. And you're going to see that for t equals 0, you get a very nice result here. I mean, nice. So this is your homotopy. This is um, yeah, t. So normally when t is 1, you get exactly the, what you want. And with t is 0, what you get is uh, x hat. Okay. Now you can see what's going on. What happens when t is what happens when t is 0? So you get when t is 0, you get h of x 0 is x minus the projection of x hat. But where is x hat? This should be k. x hat lies where? Where, where does x hat lie? x hat lies in k, which means that the projection onto k is itself. So you just get x minus x hat, right? And so we know that this has a solution, which is basically x hat, right? So it's like the identity map. So let's, let's start from here, okay? So, to, so the thing is, we've got that homotopy. To apply the homotopy invariance principle, all you need to do is show that there is no zero in the uh, edge of the boundary of omega, okay? So first thing, when t is equal to 0, we have h of x0 is equal to x minus x hat. And let's do t equal to 1 first. So when t is equal to 1, we have h of x1, which is equal to f bar nat of x. Let's just make sure everybody agrees with me. When t is equal to 1, what do you get? You get x minus the projection of x minus f bar of x, which is equal to the f bar of the natural map of x. And this is not equal to 0 when x is in the boundary of omega. Why is that? Because of the assumption. That is the case 2. That is what we started with, right? Which means 0 does not lie in h of the boundary of omega of 1. Okay. Now, when t is equal to 0, you have h of x0 is x minus x bar. And h of x0 is 0 only when x is equal to x bar. But x bar lies in omega. So x bar does not lie in boundary of omega. It lies in the interior of omega. So it follows that. So if it, it doesn't lie in the boundary of omega, then this is never equal on the boundary of omega because it's outside. As a consequence, 0 does not lie in the h of the boundary of omega of 0. Okay. So now what that tells us is, what that tells us is the endpoints are fine. So now let's take t in 0, 1. Remember what we need to do. We need to show that for all t, 0 does not lie in h of the boundary of omega. We've done it for one endpoint. We've done it for the other endpoint. We need to do it for any t in 0, 1. And that takes a little bit of algebra, not too much, right? We use the projection property. So the idea is that t in b in 0, 1, and you're left with this as the, the, the definition of h. Now, by the projection property, what you have, and I'm not going to go into the details of this because I, I really want to just give you the intuition. You can actually conclude just with two or three steps that 0 does not lie this. How do you conclude that? Basically, you're able to show that x bar minus x hat minus x bar transpose f bar is strictly greater than zero, which means this is less than zero. Okay, x, x bar minus x hat is transpose this is less than zero. And given the fact that f and f bar coincide, you get that this is less than zero and x bar does not lie in the boundary. How do you know that? 
because if it lay in the boundary, this would be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So this is a bit of algebra. I don't want to kind of you know, torture you with this because I think that's... The goal is to show you what we did. What was the avenue? The avenue was to show that for all t, 0 did not lie in h of boundary of omega. Okay? Not for, for t equal to 1, not for t equal to 0, and not for any t in 0, 1. And once you did this, you're done because then you can apply the homotopy invariance principle. So you apply the homotopy invariance principle this is independent of t, and then for t equal to 0, and then what do you say? Well, homotopy invariance principle, you know that the degree at one end is 1, degree at the other end is 1. You're done. Okay. So I'm sorry I'm not going through this algebra because I, I do think that this is, at this point, is not that relevant. The goal is to just get you to understand the steps. If you want to go and read the algebra, the algebra is not difficult, it's like five lines. Okay. So once you have that, now what you've got is you've established the next result. The next result is um, so the uh, second result is if L less than x hat, which is defined as x um, x minus x hat transpose f of x is less than 0 is bounded, right? If, if there exists an x hat in x such that this is bounded, this implies that vi xf is solvable, okay? Now, you can take the next step and you can actually show, so what is the second part of this proof? The second part was that if this is non-empty and bounded for some x hat, then this is non-empty and compact, okay? So remember, here it's just bounded, you can get a solution, but if it's non-empty and bounded, then you get that the set is, the solution set is compact, okay? Do you understand the x, the additional, the additional benefit you're getting here, you're just saying it's non-empty. Here you're saying that it's non-empty and compact, which means that the set is is actually uh, bounded. Okay. How do you prove that? Um, so if this set L hat L less than equal to X hat is bounded, it means that L less than lies inside it, which means that L less than is also bounded, which means it's com it's non-empty. Now every solution satisfies the uh, optima, I mean the the equilibrium property of the VI, right? If we set y equals x hat, you get that this holds for choosing one of them as x hat, and once you have that, you have that the solution is less than it lies in the subset of L less than equal, implying the boundedness. Okay, so you can show that for any x star, it lies in L less than equal to. That's just a step, so it's not not too difficult. Okay, so now let's look at some important corollaries because these corollaries are essentially what you will be using in your own, in your own problems, right? So the first one, as I told you, was a simple one. If K is compact and convex and F is continuous, then the solution set is non-empty and compact. How do you get that? Just by saying that the L less than equal to is obviously compact, okay? Don't worry about the proof, just the theorem statement. What is the theorem statement? So it's effectively saying strategy sets are compact, non-empty, Payoff functions are concave and continuously differentiable. You're done. Okay? I'm not worried about the interactions between payoffs. Okay? Here's another one. If there is a vector, okay, assume that there exists a vector like this, x hat such that fx transpose x minus x hat is greater than or equal to zero for all x. This holds, then the vi has a solution. Here's another one which I don't have here, which is also in, in, the, in, in the reference. Um, if there exists an x ref x such that, well, this looks a little more, but it's actually easier to prove. If I can show that this limit exists, uh, Right? 
right. So, if I can show that this limit is positive, so it is a limb inf limit infimum for some x ref, then I can. So, this is like a coercivity property, okay. It is like a coercivity property. If I can show that, again, existence follows. Um, this can be concluded from one of these types of results, okay. Now, let us go back to Nash equilibrium problems, yeah. No, all this is, I will talk about uniqueness later. So, now again, if ki is a compact convex subset, each theta i is continuously differentiable, and the theta i xi x minus i is convex. So, you need convexity and continuously differentiable payoff functions, then the set of Nash equilibrium uh, equilibria is non empty and compact. Okay. Um, I had done something on Walration, but I would rather go into monotonicity because I think that is a subclass of, of mappings for which you can say a lot more. Okay, I think that is important. So, monotonicity properties are essentially, uh, if you look at, let me start by, let me start by looking, defining a monotone map and I do not want to, let us not worry about the first one, pseudo monotone, let us just look at the, the ones after that. So, definition. So, a map going from f from x to r n is said to be monotone on x if f of x minus f of y x minus y is 0 for all x y x. Okay. Now, if I make this inequality mu times x minus y squared for all x y x not equal to y, then this mapping is called strongly monotone. and sometimes called mu strongly monotone to qualify this parameter, okay. If it is strictly monotone, it is just strictly, so this is called strictly monotone. So, these are the three important ones, monotone, strictly monotone. Um, you can get and, and strongly monotone, psi monotone just changes the slope here, I would not worry too much about that. So, the three you want to remember are strong, strict and merely monotone. The pseudo monotone which is weaker, which shows up in some economic equilibrium problems, but uh, and so what is the relationship between these? Well, clearly you can see strong is amongst the, the most restrictive uh, and pseudo is the weakest. So, strong monotone implies psi monotone, psi implies strictly monotone and this implies monotone. So, this is the weakest compared to this and monotone implies pseudo monotone, okay. Now, if the map is affine, strong, strict and psi monotone are, are equivalent, right and monotonicity is equivalent to the matrix being positive semi-definite. So, for instance, if you have an LCP, if you have an LCP, if, if the A matrix or, or the M matrix is positive semi-definite, that is a monotone problem. If the matrix is positive definite, then it is strong, strict or psi monotone, they are all equivalent, okay. Um, for general maps, for you to assess this, you need the Jacobian of the map and I am going to show you that, okay. You need to compute the Jacobian. So, remember F is a nonlinear map, right. So, when you take the in the case of the LCP, the F is actually an affine map. For LCPs, F of X is MX plus Q. We saw that before. 
for more generally, it's some nonlinear map. And if you want to establish whether something is monotone, you can take the Jacobian of the map. So remember, when you have a nonlinear map, uh, sorry, sorry um, the map, when you have a set of nonlinear functions, so now if you take the gradient, you don't say you take the gradient because it's no longer scalar. It's a vector, so you take the Jacobian of this vector, vector valued map, and this is now a matrix. If you can show that this is positive semi definite for all x, then f is monotone, right? Because what I've given you here is a wonderful, and sometimes you can establish this directly. But sometimes you need to leverage the problem property. So for instance, if you have twice differentiability, so you need twice differentiability for this. Or rather, in the case of the map, you just need once differentiability. If you have a game, you need twice differentiability, right? Because the f already has gradients of thetas. If you want to take the Jacobian, you need to take second derivatives, right? And those second derivatives imply that you need twice differentiability. Okay. So now, if the Jacobian of the map is positive semi-definite, then the map is monotone, if and only if. If it's positive definite, it's strictly monotone. If it's uniformly positive definite, what that means is that the smallest eigenvalue is bounded away from zero for all x by the same value. That's called strongly monotone. Okay? Yeah. Can you explain the difference between B and C in terms of eigenvalues? Yeah, so what this means is that the eigenvalues of this are always positive. Now, I have to be careful about this. If this is, this is not necessarily a symmetric matrix. If it's a symmetric matrix, then you want to use eigenvalues as a basis to understand positive definiteness. Remember that when you have a non-symmetric matrix, positive definiteness doesn't align with the eigenvalues. Because if you take the eigenvalues of an, an asymmetric matrix, you can get imaginary values. Right? So what you should be looking at is just this constant. And it turns out that this constant, in this case, might be a function of x. As long as there's a lower bound c, which you can compute, then it's strongly monotone. If it turns out that that value is just some positive and you can't get a lower bound, then it's just strictly monotone. Do you understand? Yes. I'll give you some examples of that. So for instance, if I gave you, um, So if I gave you um, f of x is uh, 2x, x2, uh, plus x1 squared, OK? So now if you take the Jacobian of this, what you get is 2x1 plus 2x2. Um, you get 2x2. You get uh, 3x2. And you get 3x2 squared plus 3x1. OK? Now, if you look at this problem, the question that you want to ask yourself is, what are the eigenvalues? Uh, sorry, uh, so, so then how do you check for positive definiteness? You do this. And now if you can get some lower bound beta, so you get a lower bound beta, which is a function of x times norm u squared. If you can show well, this is greater than some beta bar for all x, then you have strong monotons. If you just have something which is always positive, but you don't know what the lower bound is, then you have strict monotonicity. If you just have that it's non-negative, then it's just monotonicity. Okay, a lot of it comes down to analyzing this. Okay, there's no, there's no kind of shortcut, right? I don't have any shortcuts from this standpoint. Finally, I mean, once you get monotonicity, you can see a lot, but getting it is not always obvious. It's obvious if the mapping, the function, the original function is convex and a single player problem, then the gradient is always monotone. Now, there are some simple cases like the, the Cournot case, where it's always monotone, right? If you're lucky enough that the mapping is symmetric, right, or integrable, 
then the Jacobian is symmetric of this map. And when it's symmetric, then it's easy. You just look at the eigenvalues. But you need to know the eigenvalues for every x. So you need some structure. And do you do this anal analysis analytically or? Uh... No, you need to analyze this analytically. If you want to claim monotonicity, you can't do it computationally. It's like asking a question like, can you computationally show convexity? Well, you know, you can do it, but you're not, you know, you can't say it formally. You can just, you know, come up with some hokey statement, right? Sorry, just to make sure that. So since it's not symmetric, there is no optimization problem. No, there it's isn't here. There isn't. And, uh, yeah, and if it's, mon we, we have to check what it is. But if it's monotone, we can't say. We can't say the existence, right? But we can't say about the uniqueness. So if it's, if it's strictly monotone, then you can get existence, a uh, uniqueness. Let me show you. Okay, so if it's, uh, it's strictly monotone, we can say that it's uniqueness. So if it's strictly monotone, then you can say that there's at most one solution. And I'll show you the result. At most. But strictly you say definitely unique. Exist one solution. Yeah, there exists a solution and it's unique. So why are they important? You can articulate existence and uniqueness statements. I haven't been able to give you uniqueness statements thus far. There's also another class of mappings called P mappings for which you can get uniqueness statements. But uh, from the standpoint of uh, monotone, you, what you can get is quite strong reasonably. And then a lot of the convergence properties that I'm going to discuss tomorrow are often tied to, to monotonicity. Some are not, but I, I won't have time to go into everything. But most of the ones I'll talk about require monotonicity. Okay, so let's use convex optimization to, to quickly kind of figure out the motivation. Oh, something happened in my spacing. Okay, consider the optimization problem given by minimize theta of x, where x lies in k. So remember, an optimize, an optimi, uh, an op, basically an optimal solution of this problem is given by the solution to vi k theta, which is y minus x transpose the gradient of theta. I don't know what's wrong with my, this. It's greater than or equal to zero for all y and k. That's happened. Something happened in my typesetting in this one. Uh -huh. So when theta is convex, a convex function, and the Hessian of theta is positive semi-definite everywhere, then the gradient of theta is a monotone vector mapping. And the vi is a monotone vi, right? So, so you have some nice properties under differentiability. But now let's look at the more general set, the game theoretic problem. So consider the game theoretic problem given by these agent problems. Let ki be closed and convex. Now, we know we've done this already. We've got a vi representation. Already done that. But now let's talk about monotonicity in terms of uniqueness. Okay? So this is an important result. So let k be a closed and convex function uh, set and f be continuous. So if f is strictly monotone, then the vi has at most one solution. If it's psi monotone, then it has a unique solution. So if it's Strongly monotone, psi monotone, it's a unique solution. If it's Lipschitz continuous and psi monotone, what you can show is the distance from x to x star can be computed, bounded from above, using the natural map, which is a nice result. So if one of you got me an x and said, how far is this from the solution? I can tell you that it's no further than the right-hand side. But it's some... You know, the, the thing is that the C hat, the C bar is not known. C bar is some constant. So it's in some order sense, right? But X star is the unique solution, okay? So you can also get distance of solutions. If you have some problem properties, in some cases, you could get a refined understanding of C primers. Okay. So let's make sure everybody understands. In the monotone case, I can get uniqueness. But when I say uniqueness, I can get at most one solution. So then if I can go ahead and show that a solution exists, so if I told, told you that the set is compact, non-empty, and the function is, the mapping is continuous, we know a solution exists, so existence and uniqueness follows. So if I tell you existence follows, it means there's at least one solution. If it's strictly monotone, it means at most one solution, which means there's exactly one solution, right? So in A, you need to add the existence statement. In B, the existence statement is not necessary. This directly gives you both. Okay, so remember that monotonicity doesn't always buy you existence unless it's very strong. Okay. Why do we need the strength? Why do we need the distance? So we need the distance if you're you, if if you're trying to de develop algorithms, and you suppose you stop at a particular point, and you don't know how far you are from the solution. So what this does is it allows you to evaluate how far you are by directly evaluating. 
The problem with this statement, of course, is that this is a general statement in terms of C prime. If I don't have C prime, C prime could scale this. Generally, C prime depends a lot on Lipschitz constants and so on. But one of the things that you'll find when I talk about algorithms is we're able to come up with distance metrics. They're very useful because when you terminate a scheme, you want to have an understanding of how far you are from the equilibrium because you're not, your schemes are never going to give you the exact equilibrium. Yeah. You're always going to terminate early. So, uh, yeah. The positive semi-definiteness of the Jacobian, which is just monotonous, that tells us nothing. No, so what that tells you is, so I'm going to show you something about uh, how to modify. So one of the things I was planning to do in the exercises, which as I said, I've tried to integrate throughout the day, is if I gave you a map f of x, and I tell you that it's monotone, and if I added epsilon, where epsilon is some small constant, can anyone tell me what this, what are the properties of this map? So this map, it turns out, is strongly monotone. In fact, it's epsilon strongly monotone. So one avenue is, if you have a game, suppose I gave you a game like this, theta i x. If you add a small constant, epsilon times x i squared, this is often called a regularization. Now, if it turns out your problem is monotone, this small regularization will lead to a strongly monotone problem, and you have a unique solution, a unique equilibrium. But how to interpret it economically? Right. So economically, there is no interpretation, <laughs> except for the fact that it's an epsilon Nash game. So there is, you can, there are, there is theory on epsilon Nash games. So what I mean by that is basically this is within epsilon of the Nash equilibrium. So you can actually show, so, you know, so this is the thing, it gets a bit dangerous because I'm not an economist, so I don't want to kind of make statements which are fallacious and from that standpoint. So what are the statements I can show for these? I don't have as much in the theory here on the regularization schemes. But mathematically what I can show is if an equilibrium exists for this, this equilibrium converges to the true equilibrium as epsilon goes to zero. What you know is that x epsilon is a Nash equilibrium of the epsilon game. What is the epsilon game? It's a modified game, right? Now, you might ask me, why would players modify the objective? It's not that they've modified the objective. We've made their games a little nicer, if you will, so that we can establish something. And we can relate the equilibrium of this to some to the, to the original. So you can look at it from the standpoint mathematically that the original game has this set of equilibria. As soon as you modify it, you have one. And now what happens is if you take epsilon to zero, you converge to what is called the least norm equilibrium, where the norm of the equilibrium is minimized. Okay, so, but from, from an economic standpoint, no, and I don't wanna venture in that direction. Because it's 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 a hard question to 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 answer, in terms of why players would. This is from a designer standpoint. Uh, it depends how much price would be affected by this regularization. Yeah. So I mean, uh, you can actually get statements about how far the equilibria are, so you can relate them, right? You can relate it, and then you can also analyze how the price changes in terms of epsilon. But clearly, this is. Um, epsilon is very liquid, right? Very little, you know. So for, for those of you working in, you know, it's, it's interesting. It really depends on who you talk to about this. From my standpoint, when you're working with large systems, large network systems, and if you add something which is 10 raised to minus 8, it makes, you know, I mean, the data we get has noise of 10 raised to minus 2. I, I don't see the issue from that standpoint. But, you know, and from a mathematical standpoint, I would not like to make, you know, an economic claim. Right? I don't want to say that there is some rational reason why we should do this. This is completely from the standpoint of if you want to come up with a nearby game which is well posed, this is where it is. But as, as a person who works in optimization in this area, I'm, I'm less concerned about uniqueness. Right? I'm less concerned. But I know that, so I ask this question to a lot of the electricity markets folks that I work with. Our concern with uniqueness is because you know, we would like to have one set of tuples to work with. It's helpful from a designer standpoint. It's helpful from the standpoint of allocation 
right? If you have stakeholders, you tell them I'm picking one equilibrium versus it's extremely, so that's why I'm a little guarded about making statements about, from a mathematical standpoint, you can provide convergence, but those things don't work in the real world, right? I mean, you cannot tell somebody, well, I, I just picked an epsilon equilibrium and it just turned out it wasn't great for you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they're not. I'm also not economist, but if you can argue that this is the cost, but with this cost we uh, prove the uniqueness for the market, it might be, uh, one might be justified. But the thing is that from their standpoint, then they might say that why not just select an equilibrium from the true problem? So from their, as you said, uh, the different agents may have different. Yeah, so it really depends on who. I mean, it's if you if an agent benefits from this, he or she would be happy. I think I think considering the welfare implications of the different equilibria. So some economists would think about this from the standpoint that maybe we should have a way. You know, maybe the game itself is not well posed, right? Maybe there's some structural reason why it's not well posed. That's one. The other is: is there a way to select from the set of equilibria? Right? And so there's a selection mechanism that we are missing, and maybe we should be thinking about that selection mechanism. Okay. My last question, sorry. No, no, so fine. I think this example is a just mesh that the domain of each agent doesn't depend on the others, right? And if it's GNE, all of the statements will be changed, right? No, so if it's a GNE, a generalized Nash game, and I'll be talking about those in, in greater detail. When you have a GNE, um, the, the issue is that once you write down the, so in this particular case, right, what you did was that each agent had its own sets and you had, um, so, so you could write down the GNE, but if you had coupling across them, it depends on what, you know, what VI we're looking at. If you're looking at the VI where you've relaxed the coupling constraint and put in the multiplier, you could analyze it, right? I mean, you think about it, so just to give you an example, so if I had this problem, theta 1 of x subject to summation of xi less than b, minimize theta 2 of x summation of xi. I'm going to use shared constraint for the timing just to make it easy, right? So now x1 greater than 0, x2. One thing you could do is you relax this constraint and you write a vi in the larger space of lambda 1 and x1. And then you can write down the equilibrium conditions in lambda and x. And then you can look at that vi. And in the shared constraint world, you get monotonicity. Uh, if you use common multipliers. If you use unshared multipliers, you get, you don't get skew symmetric structures, right? So you don't, you lose monotonicity there. In general, in GNEs, you lose monotonicity, I found. And the reason for that is that the constraint. you still have it in a special case? If you have it in a special case, you can leverage all the properties you want. Because the, the, the monotonicity requirements are, are agnostic to what okay. motivated them. Right? So it's not relevant. Than that. Sorry, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah, please. Last question regarding no, no, this. no, fine. I, uh, you were saying that you can uh, evaluate the distance between uh, uh, your solution and optimal solution. Yeah. But uh, uh, in case when we have a multiple solution, can we just... You get a distance. You get a distance there. So there are, I'll, I'll do this in, when I do the algorithms. Mm -hmm. So when you have multiple solutions, yeah. then we can have, evaluate the distance to the solution set, which is the distance to the closest equilibrium. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Can we guess like the uh, range of this uh, multiple solution? Maybe so the diameter of that solution set? Yeah. That's like harder. That. I don't... I don't... I mean... I don't know a result... I mean, you can formulate problems for that, but I don't know clear expressions where you can get diameters of solution sets. That's a good question. I don't have an so answer for that. If it's very small, then maybe uh, with the presence of multiple solutions, it's a, somehow... You know, but even if you had a small, you could still have wide variability. When you say small, it, it might be that, you know, they might be small in that space, but they might lead to massive changes in payoff. Yeah. So it's not clear. I don't have a good... I don't want to make sweeping statements. Would you agree that even equilibria that are close by could have widely differing properties? It's very difficult to make that statement. I think what, what one should rather do is, um, yeah, let's talk offline about that. I have some ideas about that. Yeah, yeah. But again, uh, just, just before that, you were saying that we're trying to say, uh, define 
Krystian, czyli chodzi po swoje dęce, to inni nam tłumaczą sobie się wodę z tego, jak on sobie na przykład chodzi i tam jest dziwne. So then what I do is, um, so when you, when you have multiple equilibria, then we come up with a metric for the equilibrium, which is not the distance to the equilibrium. It's basically something called a gap function. So the gap function is zero if x is a solution to, and now what we do is for any of these equilibria, the gap function is zero. So what we do is we provide you algorithms where you can show that this is going to zero. So how do you evaluate that? The way you evaluate that is you can say that your, in terms of gap function, you're 10 raised to minus five. Now, but can you then say that you're close to one equilibrium the other? No, you have no way because you have no understanding of the structure of the equilibrium. The statements you can make about this, the set of equilibria are the following. The set of equilibria, I'm talking about not the original set, the set of equilibria is non-empty and convex. So you can't have disconnected, you can't have equilibria like this if the original mapping is, you can't have these disconnected sets. So you have connected sets uh, which are convex. When the mappings are weakened, you can show the set is connected but not necessarily convex. But I don't know any cool results on diameters of these. I think you need a lot more structure on this. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. But it will make me think more. That's a good question. No, no, but it's a good question. I should think about it because I think there's an optimization problem looming there, but I think it's a hard problem because this is what it's, I mean, to give you an idea, this is what the question is. It's, um, it's basically saying that, so if you look at these X and Y are equilibria and I want to maximize this distance. And if you look at X, X is a solution to the, this and y is a solution to the same problem. So it's a weird problem where you can write both of these as complementarity constraints and you're trying to maximize the distance. So now you'll never be able to solve this, but what you'd like are bounds. So if, if Vladimir gave me a problem, I tell you that it can't be anything larger than 10 raised to two. That's all I want to do. So maybe there is something, but it requires analysis. I don't think that it's, because it's a non-convex problem. So this is a, solving it in general is NP hard. Right, so, um, which time do I have? So, I'll give me around 10 more minutes. You went for if we can do, or? Yeah, then, then we can do some computation. Yeah, so the, you asked for correct. Or? No, no, just, can I go for 10 more minutes? Yeah, yeah. So I want to just prove some of these. Um, so the first one is that if X is strictly monotone, then uh, there is exactly, um, there's, there's at most uh, one solution. The way we usually prove this is to assume that there are multiple solutions. So start by assuming that there are two solutions. If there are two solutions called X and X prime, both of them satisfy the equilibrium relationship. Now all I do is I take x prime and put it here and put x and put it here. So I get two expressions, x prime minus x transpose f of x is non-negative, x minus x prime transpose f of x prime is non-negative. I just add these. As soon as I add these, it violates strict monotonicity. Done, right? It's a very simple proof, okay? So as soon as you do it, violates it, which means that there's no more than one solution. Okay, does everybody see this? Okay. Now, if X, F is psi monotone, you need to show it has a solution, right? Its uniqueness follows from F being strictly monotone. So all I need to show is that, uh, so, so for, remember, for psi monotone, this is the requirement, okay? So for a fixed Y, so, Remember, let me just make sure you understand this, okay? When it's psi monotone, it's strictly monotone, which means there's at most one solution. So all I need to show is there exists at least one solution. So if there exists a solution and it's at most one solution, then a solution exists and it's unique. So all that we do here is prove that existence holds, okay? 
Now remember I had shown you a result where I had said it was a result that looked like this, a coercivity type result. Now all I do is I am going to show you for psi monotone coercivity holds. Okay? So this is another thing that, that is often useful. Um, so where's the So if you look at this, right, if you look at this, what you notice is that this you can add and subtract. So whenever you have, so what you have is f of x transpose x minus y, right, which is the same as f of x minus f of y transpose x minus y plus f of y transpose x minus y. But now you have psi monotonicity, which means that this is greater than psi, what is it, psi, times some uh, x minus y raised to psi, okay, not psi, something, some c, okay, plus fy transpose x minus y, okay. And now what happens is that I take x to infinity. Now, if I take x to infinity, you have two, I'm dividing by x minus, now what happens to this one? If x goes to infinity and psi is bigger than 1, this is going to infinity at a faster rate than this, because this is going to infinity at what rate? At a linear rate. This is going to infinity at a faster rate. So what do you think this is tending to? 0. Similarly, this is tending to 1. Right? So essentially what you have is that if you can show the liminf is greater than or equal to some constant, then you have that existence form. Very simple result, right? It is two-step result. Just take limits and the result falls out. So then what you have is you've shown from strict monotonicity, you've been able to claim uniqueness. From psi monotonicity, you've been able to claim existence. As a consequence, you have that a, a unique solution holds. Or a, a unique solution exists. Okay. Now this is the the statement I was making. This is a very tractable result to kind of prove, and I've used it myself in in the context of electricity markets to show existence of equilibria, right? For a general mapping, I give you a general mapping. It doesn't satisfy monotonicity, and all I need to know is now what happens if it does satisfy monotonicity. If it does satisfy monotonicity and you still need to show existence and you don't have compactness, what you do is you start by saying, oh, it's f of x transpose x minus x ref. So this is f of x minus f of x ref. x ref is just some reference vector. Pick any vector. Pick the zero vector if you need to, as long as it's feasible. Okay, so now what is this? This is greater than or equal to zero plus something. Now the main thing that you have to analyze is the following. If you send x to infinity, right? And remember, sending x to infinity, you have to be careful. Because if you have capacity constraints, you can only go to the bounds. The only thing that you can send to infinity are prices or Lagrange multipliers or something which is unbounded. And when that happens, you need, to you need to analyze the impact on this overall thing. This is going to be some vector. If this vector does not happen to be positive, you're in trouble. So you need to find an x ref such that this vector is positive. If it's positive and x becomes sufficiently large, this becomes positive or goes to plus infinity. As long as that happens, you're done. Okay? If you have monotonicity, one part of this becomes very easy because this just drops out. If you don't have monotonicity, then you have both f of x and this. So if, if this is moving in the same direction, great. If it's moving in opposite directions, then you just have to be careful. You have to basically weigh what's happening. Okay? 
And remember, it's a limb-inf result. So basically, for all subsequences, you should be having this happening. In the worst case, it should just be going positive. In the best case, it should be going to plus infinity. Right? Yes. Okay, so, so you're saying that, if, for example, in the Christian market case, if we don't have price cap, yeah. then we don't have uh, compactness. Yeah, and then you need to use these ideas too. Then we need to use You need to use these ideas. There's actually a richer uh, result that, that is also available. So, I mean, these are, of course, I've given you a smattering of results, right? There are some more results, weaker results out there. But this is a very useful result. I've used it myself, and in a lot of cases, it helps. But actually, in the market or the PST market, the only thing that would be unbounded is the price, right? Well, uh, the price is one, but you know, when you're working with, for instance, with forward contracts, you don't have, yeah, if you're working with bidding, and if there's no cap on the participation levels, in some markets they say if you're going to show up and you're going to bid, you need to have reserve, uh, not reserves, like financial reserves, so that puts a bound. So, you know, it's, it's... So it's good to be strongly monitored, not... Yeah, <laughs> yeah but the, once you're strongly monitored, the thing is that it's a very restricted model usually. You make so many assumptions, it's hard to kind of guarantee. So, um, so that was the last, I think that's the last result that I have on the, on the uniqueness side, I think. Yeah, I'm not going to prove this one. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so this, and so tomorrow I'm going to start with this. So this is actual markets. You know, the problem that I looked at yesterday, I'm going to show you how to show existence for these problems, which are more practical, but I won't do it now. I think, I think people have seen enough of me. Let's do some coding before you throw stuff at me, right? So, so tomorrow what we'll do is we'll look at these problems and actually show existence for these problems. So you'll start seeing how we actually apply some of these ideas, okay? Um, okay, so what I've done is uh, I've started developing some code myself, and I thought uh, I could start walking you through the code. And so here's my goal with the, with the coding exercise. Um, how many of you have MATLAB within reach? If you can get at least a few on each table, then we can just you know, join up. Um, my goal is to have everybody start coding the, the beginnings of, a, of a, a networked market. And then we start kind of solving that using MATLAB solvers, and then develop very simple algorithms based on what I show you tomorrow. And hopefully then add some stochasticity and add some um, other richness so that you can actually, by the end of this, solve relatively you know, decent sized problems, but with algorithms that you've developed. Okay, so what I wanna do now is have everyone code uh, a simple Cournot model. Okay, so let me, let me give you the model. I'm gonna just draw, and I'm gonna give you the code. So, don't, you know, because I know that there's deferring kind of. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send all of you my code, right? And then what we're going to do is today, I just want you to see if you can all install the code, get it working. It's very little at this point and we'll keep adding to it, but I want to give you something you can start with. Uh, Okay, I've just sent you a code. It's a very short, and now we're gonna to add to it, okay? 
So, so you'll all get it, and I've I've used uh, MATLAB's optimization solver. So, do all of you have access to the toolboxes in MATLAB? At least just the optimization toolbox. I'm using Quadprog from there, so hopefully you should have that. You don't have it. Um, okay. Um, do you? Okay. No, no, no. Uh, I'm it's trying. Got the free trial version. The free trial. It doesn't have. Uh, usually, you can get one toolbox with it. Are you sure that you don't have that? Uh, I mean, I tried to run one, an old optimization problem that I had, and it didn't work. It didn't work. No. Okay. But I didn't have the optimization. Problem. Okay. Maybe I just didn't uh, yeah, maybe you can see if. Because um, the other thing is that to see if you can download. Uh, Trying to see if there's a public domain version that you can download. Um, see, is it a pretty straightforward problem because I can just do it in Python. Yeah, you can do it in Python. Yeah, you can do it. if you have Python access. Yeah. You can see my code. It's very simple. It'll take you, you know, a few few minutes to do. I mean, I don't see it as being particularly. So have a look at it. Um, so, did you guys get it? Okay. So does it run? Okay, so has everyone been able to run it? So let's start kind of just checking certain things. I want to make sure everybody sees it. Um, pardon? Did you get it? Yes. Okay, so. So currently what I've got is a fairly general one with um, CIQI plus half DIQI squared minus an affine function of Q times um, QI with the requirement that QI is less than capacity of I and is greater than zero, right? So you remember what the Cournot output was without, so remember we had our first statement, right? So if you said, if you said di equals zero and b equals one, b is the inverse price function, it's a minus b times q, I think. You should get, let me just check my code to remember what my, what my notation was. Uh, and I'll tell you what I want you to do next. Let me just put this up so you can see it. What happened? Okay, so okay, so you can see this, right? So if you make d zero and b one, and you run it, what you should get is the Cournot output. So remember the 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 canonical Cournot output is a minus c over three. So I want to make sure everybody gets that. So in this case, A was A was 10, uh, C was whatever, 0.1. And what you get is um, A minus C is 9.9. .9. So you should get that both, you know, the agents, both agents have an output of 3.3. .3. Right. So, for the folks who've been able to download the code, I think one of uh, one of you has not been able to get Quadprog working. The rest of you, you guys have Quadprog working. You don't have it. Is that because it's MATLAB doesn't have the MATLAB doesn't have the optimization solver? When you run it, what does it say? Quadprog. Sorry. 
says undefined function quad frog. Yeah, it doesn't have the. Do you? Uh, is this the trial version? No, it's the one from the from my institute. Just to help Optim, help H E L P. Here. Yeah. Help. Space. O P T I M. Uh, to help toolbox, maybe just I don't know how to check what toolboxes are installed. Yeah, I'm not sure what the term is for toolbox. No, um, you can't see which toolboxes are. So I've never worked with you never. Okay, what are you comfortable with? You can just switch to whatever you're comfortable with. If you think that R is better or Python. So for those of you who want to use Python, your question. Oh, which um, do you have? Are you using DTU normal or the DTU guest? Which DTU normal? Yeah, I'm not sure. You like Jalal? Do you know why his pa password may not be working for DTU? Should be right. Yeah, because mine works. Which one? DTU or DTU guest? Not guest. Just DTU. It works for everyone. No. We'll just, just check. Uh, is there anyone who has done connect with DTU? Okay. No, with DTU connection, is there any problem? You might just check because everyone has to. Okay. Um, so, so, the, so here's what I'm thinking of doing now. Okay. So there are two or three things I want to change. So the one thing that I want you to see is that you can, you know, this is a fairly general model where you have different cost fun you know, you can have different cost functions. I want you to change C to point 0.1 instead of N, make it times, uh, I think it's, I think the right code is uh, 1 colon N prime. Let me just check, I f keep forgetting the syntax sometimes. Uh, just hang on a second. Okay. Okay. Just hang on a second. No? <coughs> okay. Okay, so now what you can start doing is, so suppose you change this to the cost function to 1 colon n and a prime, so this is a transpose. So what this does is it makes the cost functions 1, 2, 3, 4 for different players, right? So what you immediately start seeing, what do you expect to happen? In different locations. Well, at this point, it's a single location problem. You expect that high cost producers would do what? 
Exactly. So at equilibrium, you expect high cost producers to produce less, right? And that's exactly what I see. I want you to make sure that you can see that, right? Um, okay. So f for those folks who are not, who don't have it, maybe you guys can link up with people who have it working. Uh, until you get something else functional. Um, the second question that I want to think about is, um, so now you can see that if, if you look at this, currently I'd set the B to B. So remember what I'm doing here, I want to make sure everybody understands. What I've done is I've taken the LCP and I've rewritten it as a quadratic program. I can do that in Cournot because the map is the, uh, the problem is, is, is positive semi-definite. I can do it. Remember the way we talked about. In general, I can't do that. Now, if you look at the code, the D was set as zero. D represented the quadratic part of the cost. If you make that something small but positive, you'll f what, do you, what do you expect to find? You expect that the dispatch levels become even smaller, right? The cost functions are going up. So what's happening is you have a more rapid increase in terms of cost. So now we've got quadratic costs, we've got affine price functions. What do you expect if, if um, so let me ask you this. What is the capacity constraint on this? What have you set the capacity constraint at? What are the capacities that we've set? What is the cap? It's 1e raised to 8, right? Yeah. So it's an unconstrained problem. At what point do you expect that this equilibrium will be affected? What change of the capacity will lead to this equilibrium be being affected? Suppose I make it 10, will it be affected? You need to make it active. You need to make it active. You need to make sure that the dispatch levels that you have in the unconstrained regime are being pushed down, right? So if you make it five, it's not going to be affected. So maybe you can make one of the capacity levels two and see how the equilibrium changes. Okay? And then I'm going to give you something more challenging. I want to just make sure everybody's familiar with. Um, hey, you, uh, what's your name? Emily. Emily. I actually got it to work. Oh, you got it to work? Yeah. What did you do? I just, you could download another toolbox. So. Oh, you could. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you can download a toolbox. But I think you should have to start with the free trial version. Oh, she has, okay, she needs a free trial version. Okay. Um, I mean, she can do it, but it might take some Yeah, time. yeah, no, that'll take time. So it's strange, you know, uh, do they give you any toolbox? Because usually they give you at least one toolbox. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you measure? I can check with the IP. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing you can do is when you go home, you can see whether you can. So those of you who. I'm not sure if this will work. For those of you who don't have access to MATLAB, there is a version of MATLAB which is public domain called Scilab. I haven't looked at it for a while. But Scilab is very much like MATLAB, but it's free. And I just don't know if Quadprog works on it, but you can see if they have a version. You just have to change the function name. The other thing you could do is download um, some public domain quadratic programming solvers in MATLAB. I'll check when I go home. I mean, I go back to the hotel and see if there is. Does everyone else, has anyone, is anyone else having trouble with getting it running? Because I want to make sure that if we can all get it running, then we can build on this. Anybody else? Carla? It's working? Okay, good. Farzana, are you getting it working? Okay, fine. Okay, so were you guys able to change the capacities? So you're able to see a change in the equilibrium. So for instance, if you change the capacities to you know, two and two, you can see immediately there's a change. Okay, the dispatch levels come down to two. Now, what you notice is that this is a very general model. I can change n to 10. And you can run this again, right? It's not, not too difficult. So uh, the goal is to try and see whether we can move to the network regime. Right, you can do this. 
Now, if you make n 10, what do you think? Why do you think this is happening? So don't ignore this. These are the multipliers. These are the dispatch levels of the first 10. Why do you think it's coming down in this fashion? So one of the things as you know, market designers, you have to get used to seeing weird stuff. And you have to start interpreting why that's happening. So why do you think dispatch levels are going down? What did you do in your costs to make that happen? So we changed costs, right? We made costs what? Look what I showed you here. I made costs increasing. Goes 1 to n transpose. So the costs are increasing. So beyond a point, it doesn't make sense for a player to actually for a player to actually dispatch because they lose money. Okay? So you can see that beyond player 4, everything is gone. Right? Now, the next thing I want to yeah, questions? Were you guys able to raise n to 10 or something to see whether it works? Yeah, OK. So I'm thinking of giving them a simple generalized Nash yeah. with shared constraints just now so they can get that. Yeah. Right? And then once they have that, then at least they know how to solve the VI version of that. Okay. With the same duals. With the same duals. It's a little easy because the QP won't be able to deal with the other one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. Working? Okay, good. Um, okay, so. So this I want you guys to start thinking about, and we're going to code this together. So let's talk about the two-player problem and make one change. OK, so we have ci, c1, q1, minus p of q times q1. Now I'm going to impose a requirement that q1 plus q2 cannot be greater than something. Let's make this some, you know, I don't know, um, some, I don't know. Not cap, I don't want to use cap. Let's call it uh, H, some beta, okay? Q1, okay. Now, so every player has this constraint, okay? So this is often when you have, so, you know, when you're working with environmental problems, you often impose these types of requirements because it's, it's uh, like a, you know, a permit market or something where you have, all of you have to share this, this quota, if you will, okay? So how do you model this? The way we model this is we say every player has access to this, but we are going to assume that the price of this is common to all players, and I want to figure out what that price is, right? So how do you do that? So how do you model that? You write down the KKT conditions with this lambda, okay? So what you're going to get is the following. So remember what this is. This is A minus B times Q. So this is Q plus Q1. Um, and you also had Q1 is less than capacity. So you have uh, minus lambda 1, not lambda 1, let's call this mu, mu 1, minus mu 1, minus lambda from this guy is uh, this yeah, greater than, no, I forgot something, right? Yeah, there's a quadratic term, C1 plus, so, so I get this, uh, Q1, C1 plus DQ1 plus BQ plus Q1 and minus A. Right, I get a minus A, I forgot that. This is D1, minus lambda 1, minus, minus mu 1, minus lambda greater than 0. Okay, and this is um, mu 1 cap minus Q1 non-negative. And now this is for all I. 
for all i and then you get one extra constraint which is this beta minus q1 plus q minus q2 is greater than 0 okay so now if you look at if you look at the the complementarity problem if you look at the complementarity problem If you look at the complementarity problem, what you're left with is the following. Yeah. Oh, is it mu one minus mu? Oh, lambda lambda. Sorry. So lambda and also is it minus mu one or plus because you already have. Oh, you already have. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Okay. So then you have. Then you have uh, you have d times i plus b times i plus e e transpose um, uh, plus mu vector of mu plus um, so now this is going to be lambda times e. So I want to make sure everybody understands how I'm doing this. I'm concatenating all of these. So you need to kind of get used to doing that. Plus C minus A times E. This is E is the column of ones because look, the A gets replicated for each I. I want to do this in general. I want you to get used to doing this in a matrix theoretic form. Okay, that's important. It's an important part of this, this uh, avenue that you get used to that. Okay. Um, so these are the these are the KKT conditions corresponding to Q, and now we need complementary slackness conditions. So the first one is mu, which is cap the vector of capacities minus the vectors of Q. Uh, sorry, the vector of decisions, and you have lambda, which is uh, beta minus E transpose Q. Okay. Now. What we do is we are going to write this as a single LCP. Okay, it's going to be zero is less than Q um, I'm gonna call this um, not Z, call this uh, let's call this uh, eta orthogonal to so this is going to be, hang on a second, this is Q here, okay, sorry. So it's DI plus BI plus EE transpose, okay, that's the Q part. I'm going to get identity for the mu part and I'm going to get uh, E for, this, for the lambda part. Then I'm going to get negative identity here and negative E transpose here. Now, whenever you do these things, right, you should be thinking it looks like it should be skew symmetric. Look, this is symmetric and this is skew symmetric. Okay? And now you're left with Q lambda, sorry, Q mu lambda. And what you're already left with here is C minus AE capacity and beta. That's the complementary problem, right? So now in the QP, the only thing that's going to change is we're going to add, sorry, this part. Okay? So let me, so if you think about where that is, look at the QP that I've got. The M matrix I've got has everything except that. All you need to do is add another column and I'll show you how to do it. So the E is 1's n comma 1. 
then you get a zeros n comma 1 and then you get minus 1's 1 comma n zeros 1 comma n and just 0 I think okay and then this is just beta and all I need is beta is say 4 let's see 5 or something let's see if this works I'm not sure if I've made a mistake okay let's see if this works okay you can see it so you can so you want to put this make this modification in your code to get so what are we trying to do with this this is called a shared constraint Cournot game where you have a coupling across the strategy sets right which means that the amount you dispatch has to be constrained by a single you know by some by 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 some beta okay so so you should and you can see the solution the solution that i got because i put a beta which was 5 you can see that the x 1 to 10 uh, the sum of that oh sorry I did something what did I do sum no it was lowercase oh didn't I do that oh I put a lower okay <laughs> still doing it what have I got oh, I got caps lock on okay see it's 5 so it's meeting the shared constraint and now if you want to figure out what the, the Lagrange multiplier is, this is the Lagrange multiplier. That constraint is active. Okay. So you can price that. Okay. Now, um, so I want to make sure everybody has gotten that. Were you guys able to make that change? So yeah, let me show you the code again. So what I want to do is also give them a system operator. I good to remove the kernel and to put this as the price setter. Yeah. I think it's really good idea. Yeah. So once we have that, yeah. then we have a working code. Yeah. Um, that, that would be good. So what I want them to do is use the the notes, look at it, think about it, yeah. and then be ready to. Yeah. And I'll do it. But what I we can do, we don't. We can ignore the transmission system. Just yeah. Price setter. Just price setter. Right. And get that working. And the lambda, the price. Is yeah. Available. Yeah. But also, if we can show um, the, the how to check the monotonicity, ah, the but existence and uniqueness. So I think problem. yeah, tomorrow we'll be looking at the actual problem. Yeah, that would be really yeah, great. that's. But it's for a more general problem, so we'll have to. Um, but usually, it just comes down to. <laughs> there's no, there's no shortcut. It's just, you know, I'll, I'm going to go through some examples. Where, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. the. They spend like one hour, two hours just for a simple example. Yeah. How to derive complementarities, how to yeah. solve it, then how to derive the game map, the Jacobian matrix, how to show that it's monotone or it's trying monotone. Yeah. And based on that, we can conclude um, this equilibrium. Also to show that the game map, for example, is symmetric, so we have an equivalent optimization problem. Yeah. So that, that uh, the game map being symmetric is almost impossible. Because think about it, whenever you have constraints, you have skew symmetry. Uh, so you can all you can do is you can rewrite as another optimization problem, but it still might be a constraint problem. But yeah, that's still not too bad. That's still not as long as it's skew symmetric, you can do it. So it's in some form. But, but when you derive the game map, the Jacobian matrix, you yeah. just write for objective functions, right? Not for the constraints. So it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing it just in terms of the objective functions, yes, just for the objective functions, no constraints, just uh, to show that. The Jacobian, uh, the game map in terms of objective function is symmetric. Yeah, if you did that, then you, yeah, then you can write that as another optimization problem over this larger set, yeah, over the Cartesian. Um, Subject to the collection of all the constraints. Of right. The I mean, yeah, that should. 
Yeah, so you... Um, then the market, the equilibrium is always symmetric, right? Because we don't so you could, yeah, you should be able to, I think, yeah, I think that should be, I'm just trying to think about from the standpoint of the, the optimization, or we should, yeah, I think we should be able to do that, yeah. Uh, we can talk afterwards, yeah, yeah. because exactly, I, I like also to check with you, my, yeah. my, let's say. Intuition on that, yeah. Intuitions or. Yeah, yeah. Okay, hey guys, were you able to see, okay, so here's what I want you guys to think about, right, so. If you look at the first lecture I, I gave you, the lecture, uh, I think it was lecture zero, lecture, I don't know about that. So, no, it was lecture, sorry, lecture one. So, one thing I want, want you to think about is, if you think about this problem, Right? Let's, let's take the perfectly competitive problem. Now you have something for Nash Cournot. If you were to construct a similar, a similar uh, framework for the perfectly competitive, how would you do it? Okay? You don't have to do it now, but I'm, I want you to think about that. Similarly, if you wanted to add the system operator, okay, this is important. If you can add the system operator, what happens is that, remember, you don't want to directly add it. You want to write down the complementarity conditions. And then you want, and you're going to see a skew symmetric structure, which you can then again rewrite as a QP. Now, we don't always have to do this. We can directly solve this problem before it reaches there using a solver called path, which is a complementarity solver. But in this, in this course, I want you to get used to, you know, moving between certain formulations. Um, so there's no homework in this course, but if you want to think about one thing, maybe this, this is something you can think about. Tomorrow what we'll do is we'll start looking at adding the system operator, okay, and looking at perfectly competitive problems. And also thinking about algorithms, okay. So tomorrow we'll be spending a lot more time on the algorithmic question and on trying to establish how to apply some of these existing statements, okay. What kind of algorithms? So we'll be looking at uh, first order algorithms for solving these. So basically algorithms where you use projections onto the set uh, with, a, with the caveat trying to show that the sequence that they produce does indeed converge. If it converges, what rate does it converge at? And so on. Okay. Yes, Arno? Ah. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which one is this? Do you know which? You would like what? Uh, the light? Which one is this? Oh. Oh, this one. Okay, let me just show you this. So, what I wanted to do was add a shared constraint to the Cournot game. So, if you add a shared constraint, then the KKD conditions for each player become like this. You get a multiplier, which is common to all the players. We, we, ma we make the assumption that the multiplier is common. So, if you have two players, both players have this constraint, but they have a common Lagrange multiplier. So when you write down the KKT condition, there's a single lambda that, call, that is there for all the players. Now if you stack these up, you're left with this complementarity system. Yes. Sorry, you write Yeah. So I didn't write for all i, but the other i's follow similarly. So if you had, so suppose more generally what you'll have is Qi is Ci plus Di Qi plus B times Q plus Qi minus A plus mu I plus lambda. So now when you stack these up, you get the full vector mu of Lagrange multipliers. Lambda multiplied by ones, because it just gets replicated, C minus A multiplied by ones, E is the column of what's. This is a vector, mu, and then you get capacity, which is a vector, and q is also a vector. Lambda is a scalar, and it's orthogonal to beta minus the summation of q, a single constraint. So in the shared constraint situation, you have basically one extra constraint and one extra column here. Okay? So this allows you to start thinking about shared constraint games, which is a special case of generalized Nash games. Okay? 
And then you can rewrite that quite simply. And so the code that I put on the board, which I just wrote out, you can look at this. And I can send this to you if necessary. We just changed it slightly. So you can see that all you do is you just add another row here and another column here. OK? Any question, uh, Alicia? Once, because the reason why it's ones is because the lambda is common to all, right? It's common. Okay. So, uh, what's the what's the significance of this? Uh, the, the lambda for this shared constraint. Like the lambda represents the common price of the shared constraint. So, if you can view this in certain cases, this could be viewed. So, if you think about this, right? If, uh, not in this case. I mean, this is an artificial example. In certain cases, this is like the marginal cost price. Because it's the price on supply demand, right? It can be viewed in that fashion. And it's a price that everyone seems. And so it can be a consequence of something like a uniform pricing auction, where everybody sees the same price. Okay? But not in this case, because here you, the price setting is different, right? The price setting is through Cournot. So I, I don't want to kind of, that's why I'm a little guarded about, but I, I wanted to do it so you can just get used to the modeling. Okay? So tomorrow I want you to start thinking about, we'll start looking at adding the independent system operator. Okay, so we have, and an, maybe a smallish network, so I'll think about how we can do that.